Hello, today we're going to be talking about some global water problems. So when we start looking at water as a resource, we find that there are three problems that come up. Either you have too much water in an area, you have too little water in an area, or you have poor water quality due to some sort of contamination or pollutant. So we're our lecture today is going to focus mostly on having too much water. Next time we'll talk about having too little, and then later on in the unit we'll talk about the different types of pollution that can occur. So one thing that's important to recognize is we only have so much fresh water on Earth, and it's not evenly distributed. So some countries have more than others, some continents have more than others. Uh, remember that seasonal patterns are going to differ, and that's going to change the amount of water. Remember that the interior of continents are going to have very different weather patterns than the coastlines, so that changes things as well. Um, and when we really start thinking about it in terms of drinking water, you see that there's a huge number of people who really don't have good access to drinking water throughout the world. Population growth, unfortunately, makes this problem even worse. So these are just a few examples of the problems that population growth can cause. And we know that the world population continues to grow, that it keeps getting bigger and bigger. And as it continues to grow, there's going to be even more demand for fresh water on Earth. Our water supplies are very vulnerable um, in these areas where we have large populations. And if you even just look at the U.S. population, you see that our population growth tends to be highest in these areas that are already stressed and already having trouble providing enough water for the people that are there. This goes worldwide, and it's another issue because in many times, places, you don't have a particular water resource that's devoted to one particular country. If you have a mountain range that runs through many countries, those mountains probably drain into all of the different countries, and then they're sharing that water source. So if it's an area where there's some instability in the first place, it can become a very volatile situation. So for example, the Jordan River, the Nile River, both in that Middle Eastern area, both where there's a lot of conflict going going on as it is, and then now you're introducing this stress of not having enough water and having to share your resources, it can be an, an even bigger problem. A local example of this is our Chesapeake Bay watershed, and the reason why we have some conflicts in this watershed sometimes is even though we're all part of one country, states make up a lot of their own laws. Um, they all have different policies. Our watershed spans a huge area. It incorporates six states and the District of Columbia, and that's almost 18 million people. It's the largest in terms of land to water ratio out of any watershed in the entire world. Um, so that means that all of that land that's around the bay drains into that very small actual area of water and it kind of concentrates all those toxins coming off of the land into the bay. So over a hundred thousand tributaries are bringing in any pollutants that are in there. So every resident in this area is impacting your watershed in some way. You are definitely impacting it but you can see there's a lot more people who are as well. Right, so when we're talking about these issues, it's just important to keep in mind that a lot of times this is why we have such severe impacts when we run out of water or we have too much water is because we're dealing with so many people and they have to work together to share this resource. So today we're going to focus mostly on what happens when we have too much water. And you're probably familiar, the most common occurrence where you have too much water is flooding. So usually flooding is caused by some sort of unusually heavy rainfall, or in some cases you have a rapid snow melt or a glacier that breaks down and lets water loose. There's some sort of destruction of a barrier that was holding water back in many cases, so a dam may break down, something like that. And remember that every river has this natural floodplain, this area where it does traditionally flood. A lot of times, unfortunately, we build within that floodplain, and that changes the channel. If it's a flash flood, so it happens very quickly, um, that's usually happening because the rain is coming down so quickly that the ground cannot soak it up fast enough. 
um, doesn't matter how permeable it is, it just won't go in. So it runs down into the river and then the river rises very, very quickly. So one thing that controls the amount of flooding is a levee. And there's two types of levees. There's natural levees and then there's man-made levees that we build. So natural levees form because every time the river floods, it leaves behind some sediment on the banks. And then that keeps happening and building up until you get kind of these edges on the banks. And they help prevent really severe flooding in the future. Of course, if you get a bad enough flood, it's still going to go over the levees. Uh, there's lots of things that sort of um, affect how much flooding you're going to get. So all of those things are kind of shown here. Um, and a lot of them have to do with our human impacts on the area as well. This is just an example of some severe flooding. So this is St. Louis, Missouri, uh, normal conditions, and then during the flood. And you can see how much that river has really overflowed. Um, in a natural floodplain and a natural river system, you will have these periods of flooding. And usually that's good for the ecosystem because it brings nutrients out from the river and into the soil and it helps replenish things like nitrogen and phosphorus that are used up by plants. Also, in a natural ecosystem, you have lots of plants, trees, and other things that are absorbing a lot of the water. And when it floods, the roots of those trees hold the soil in place. So the soil does not erode. You have these areas called meanders that we talked about, where they kind of curve, and that slows the water down, which again prevents erosion. Um, and then we have these wetlands that also help to soak it up and provide important habitat using that water. One important term that goes along with um, rivers in general is a riparian zone. So what a riparian zone is, is it's the area around the river, um, and it usually follows a particular pattern of species that live there. And each of these species does something for the river. So uh, the soil moisture decreases as you get further from the river. That changes the type of species that are there. But these species are all needed to kind of keep the river healthy. So here are some of the things that they do. The ones that are very close to the river itself provide a lot of stability for the banks so it doesn't erode. Uh, the ones that are further away provide a lot of the food sources, like the debris, the leaf litter that is going to go into the stream and provide food for the organisms there. They also shade the stream, and that helps keep it from getting too hot. It keeps the temperature regulated. In addition to that, the ones even further upland provide essential habitat for organisms, but then they also help to filter the water, slow down the flow of the water coming off of the hillsides into the stream, reduce erosion, they provide organic material for everything to live off of, and that's where a lot of the sediment and nutrients is coming from, is up the hillside from the river. These are a few more effects I'd like you to take note of, um, including the edge effect, that happens along these rivers. These are all important um, aspects of these riparian zones. Sometimes they get called bu riparian buffer zones because they act as a buffer between the river and the surrounding environment and they protect it um, and keep it healthy. So the problem is with humans coming in and changing these areas around rivers, you get a totally different system. Uh, so here's your normal healthy riparian zone and what can happen is we come in, we usually dig up, the, well, cut down trees, dig up areas, this increases erosion, it takes away all those ecosystem services that that riparian zone was um, doing for us and it causes a whole bunch of problems. So deforestation alone um, is a big issue because the forests and the other wooded areas are going to help absorb that precipitation. The plants are using that water for photosynthesis. So they absorb it and they cycle it back to the atmosphere through transpiration. If we remove those trees, now that water isn't being recycled the natural way that it would. So you're more likely to get a flood in the first place because the water's not being taken up as quickly. In addition, when you do something like clear cutting, that 
results in your runoff kind of speeding up. So as the water moves over the land, it goes faster and faster because there's nothing in its way to slow it down. And then that will significantly increase soil erosion and that will also cause it more likely to flood. Um, this is especially a problem on hillsides where it can wash away entire areas of sediment if it, there's enough water that's built up enough speed. Another way we really alter this is when we're planning our infrastructure for cities, any sort of development at all. So whenever we have um, any sort of buildings or paved roads, they really don't absorb water. They're what we call impervious surfaces. Um, so these things basically increase the amount of runoff that you get because now instead of it absorbing into the ground, it's just running along the surface. It also concentrates it all together. We also, in our city planning tend to build things like levees and that changes flood patterns as well and it's going to have impacts down the line. So let's look more at each of these a little bit. So impervious surfaces, as I said, are surfaces that water cannot drain through. And because it can't drain through it, it's going to keep running along it until it gets to an area where it can drain. Uh, so most common impervious surface that you can probably think about is something like concrete or an asphalt roof, something like that, where uh, the pavement and the parking lot, where the water's not going to get through. Something that's slightly more pervious might be really tightly packed soil. It's still not going to let a ton of water through, but it can definitely soak in a little bit, especially if there's a lot of clay. It's fairly impervious to water. Um, if you have a lot of gravel, that may allow a little bit more through, but it's still fairly impervious. The most pervious surfaces are the ones that have a huge amount of uh, plant cover on them. And these plants help to soak up the water and they also help to sort of filter it out as it goes through. So there's a few more examples of pervious and impervious surfaces here, or another way to say it is impermeable and permeable. Impermeable, same thing as impervious. Um, and you can see that the more development we have, the more impervious surfaces we have in these areas. And the impact of that is really, really significant. It's hard to think about how much water actually falls on our ecosystem all the time. But just one inch of rain in a one acre area will cause this many gallons of water of ru in runoff. And this is in a wooded area. Look how much that increases when we now turn that wooded area into a parking lot is very, very significant. And that's just one acre of land. So this uh, compounds when you start looking at whole cities that are built this way. This impervious surface is a very bad thing for so many reasons. Um, you're concentrating that r runoff. You're basically pushing it all into areas where it wouldn't normally be. And there's a direct correlation to the health of the ecosystem that happens when you do that. So you can see that here we have the percent impervious surface covering an area and the biodiversity in the area dramatically decreases as you increase that impervious surface. Lots of other things happen, like the water starts to become warmer. You start to be ha having more and more erosion. Um, you have more and more pollution because it's all getting concentrated. There's lots of negative impacts to that ecosystem. So we have kind of a controversial um, law in place right now in Maryland that is getting a lot of attention in the press um, about impervious surfaces. And you probably know it as the rain tax, but that's a term that politicians have made up. Um, it's actually called the Watershed Protection and Restoration Program. And that name speaks a lot more to what it's really all about. So the whole point of the thing is to start to develop better stormwater management and erosion control um, so that we can reduce the bad impacts of all of these impervious surfaces and all of this runoff that's coming off into the bay. So we're really just trying to improve water quality. 
Now, all counties are technically liable to do this, but you might hear that Charles County, Montgomery County, and Prince George's County don't have to pay this. That's not totally true because the case in that county is they had already implemented a stormwater remediation fee. So their residents were sort of already paying it before it went into law. Now, what's tricky about this is every county gets to decide who gets charged what. Uh, most of the counties are going to tax the businesses more than the residential homes. All of the counties have a maximum amount that you can charge per property, and most of them are actually fairly reasonable. Um, but there's a lot of misinformation about th this law out there, and a lot of people are not really educated on what it says, and I think that's why they get so upset about it. It's been used as sort of a political tool in this state. Um, when you start to look at the science behind the law and the reasoning behind the law, it all comes back to those impervious surfaces. Um, permeable surfaces, like natural forests, are going to filter out pollution and soak up the water from runoff. When we get an area of all impervious surfaces, particularly a city, this is going to funnel all of that runoff into our stormwater management systems, and it's going to bring all the pollution with it and there's got to be a way to deal with it. We have to deal with it somehow because it's basically destroying our water quality to a point that it's not usable for us anymore. Um, so the reason why they came up with this idea to deal with all of these pollutants is when you look at the different sources of nitrogen pollution in the Bay, and we'll talk about nitrogen later, but it's one of the major sources, um, urban and suburban, polluted runoff from these impervious surfaces is the only source of nitrogen that keeps growing year after year. So overall, agriculture and sewage treatment plants are actually more responsible for the nitrogen pollution. However, they're getting better, and the levels coming from agriculture and sewage treatment are going down. The levels coming from the runoff off of these impervious surfaces keep going up, so we're not getting better in this area. So basically, this is to help us try to get better. Um, so in order to do that, we need better stormwater management. But this is really expensive, so that's part of the idea behind this is to fund that. Um, and it, this is going to help because as impervious surfaces channel large quantities of rainwater into the stream at a really high speed, that runoff is what's wreaking the havoc. Um, that flow, it, it destroys the stream banks, it destabilizes the whole stream system and changes the depth of the stream. It puts mud into the drinking water and also carries bacteria with it, which makes water treatment more expensive for these municipal areas. Uh, the suspended sediments can also block sunlight from the underwater grasses that form the basis of the food chain. And then on top of that, the bacteria that are carried in the stormwater can also cause illnesses and wherever you have these impervious surfaces, you also tend to have a higher occurrence of flooding in local streets and local basements. And this costs the homes and the businesses money also. So if we can develop a better methods of stormwater management, in the end, we may actually be able to save people money, but it costs money to do that in the first place. Um, so the EPA has basically come out with this clean water blueprint for the Chesapeake and it mandates that all the states that drain water into the watershed need to have a plan and need to show improvement in their water quality. So the Maryland rain tax or the watershed protection and restoration program is basically how we're saying we're going to deal with this. And the money does go directly towards those stormwater management programs. So the whole idea is we need to improve this stormwater system. All right, so just to recap a little bit here, whenever we develop areas, these are the negative impacts of that development that can cause us to have problems where we have too much water in an area. Um, this picture also shows this pretty well. You can see that you have 
much, much more surface runoff in developed areas and much less actually seeping down to the groundwater. And the more impervious surface, the, le the more runoff and the less infiltration into that groundwater and replenishment of the groundwater you get. Also, the less transpiration you get because you have fewer plants. Um, just an example that I want to give you, this is the Dead Run Watershed, which is in an area of um, Baltimore County. Um, and you can see just from the topography of the land, you can see where the roads and the developments have gone in, and those all impact this watershed. Um, so this is Baltimore City, and the blue streams are where we still have streams, but all these little dotted lines are areas where we used to have a stream that now it, there's no more stream there. It's either underground in our stormwater management or it's just gone. It's draining completely differently than it used to. Um, and if you look at this picture, it looks pretty similar, but these red ones are just the storm drains. So now all of that water that was in the rivers is mostly running through those storm drains, or it's running right down the roadways themselves, and it's picking up pollutants as it does that. Um, so Another problem with this is as things pick up speed through these water diversions, these um, rainwater catchment systems, um, this not only causes flooding and erosion, and you see all this sediment that's been dropped off here by a storm, um, but it can flood so badly that it can actually overflow into the local areas. It has killed people who have been down here in flash floods. Um, I want to show you this picture. This is Lansdowne High School. Um, Baltimore County uh, right here and here's a river that runs behind it. You can see the riparian zone around there. Um, I want to show you what the topography looks like in terms of where the streams would run and here you can you can see that stream cutting through back there uh, but you can also see a lot of the impervious surfaces that are going to drain water into that stream as well. And because of all the development around here and all those impervious surfaces, um, you've had some really major floods uh, recently. Um, so this was one in 2004, and it's a flood of record, meaning that it, it broke all the records. It's one that they haven't seen before. And this is how much it flooded. So if you zoom in here, the yellow area um, is what it flooded to. And the blue area is really the most flooded this area had ever been before in the last 500 years. Um, so you can see that it's really, really significant how much more it has flooded. And you can see the impacts of it on the school grounds. So you can see how high this flood got to in these pictures here and how it carried a lot of erosion with it. And luckily this is an area where there are a fair amount of plants. Trees are much better than grass in this case. Um, but it's still causing major impacts. I'd like to give you one more case study about flooding, um, and this is in California in 2006. And I give you this example because they're looking at more sustainable development in this area now. So it flooded, these expensive levees broke, and so they decided to try to implement a different solution. So instead of rebuilding close to the river, they left a lot of that f natural floodplain undeveloped, so it allowed that room for the river. They used it as areas for parks and things like that instead. Um, and then they s built smaller levees further away. So the advantages of this, it's less expensive in the first place, it's more sustainable because it's allowing the river that room, and it's providing the natural benefits of the flood to the ecosystem. Um, so this allows this whole ecosystem to sort of recover. Um, and this is becoming more and more popular because we see the benefits of allowing nature to kind of take its course. So uh, what we've done traditionally is really channelize rivers and straighten them out, and that's what causes all of these problems with stream flow and erosion and that sort of thing um, and impervious surfaces. And what we're kind of advocating for more now is that for flood management, we should bring that those levees back, let the river develop its la natural meanders and its natural areas again. Um, and that's a lot of the recommendations that people are using, looking into urban planning now. And hopefully that's going to alleviate a lot of those problems that are caused by floods. Um, and be remember, when we plan things sustainably in the first place, there's less cleanup after. So that can save us a lot of money as well. 
All right, so I want you to come in tomorrow prepared to kind of look at your local water resources um, and local watershed and bring in some of these issues. All right, see you later.